some straight talk for some, just some, in the media. How about, in honor of the American soldier, you quit making things up. Ex-Governor Palin, she's stepped down. She's out of office now. She can move quickly, silently, roaming freely, a maverick ninja. But before she goes, she is right. We owe her an apology. And by we, of course, I mean the media. They asked me to speak for them because they're all a little ashamed. We apologize on behalf of the liberal media conspiracy that giggled over stuff like this. We apologize, Sarah, to your head, to that other woman's body, and for that matter, to the rifle. And on behalf of the vast right-wing conspiracy, I apologize as well for raising you up on a pedestal so high you could see the White House from there. And we really, we're really ashamed of this. What newspapers and magazines did you regularly read? You um, all of them. Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, I'm sorry, that was one of yours. Is there anything that Sarah Palin could do or might do that would make you guys say, no, she's not news anymore? You will go anywhere to follow everything that she says because there's mo nothing you like more than making fun of her. She hunts, she's got five kids, she's a walking style crime, and you guys, you're just gonna follow her everywhere because she's the gift that keeps on giving. I, I, I'm gonna speak for a second, not so much as a liberal, but a guy who has made fun of people for a living, and t to a certain extent, Sarah Palin <laughs> is like one of those hunting reserves where they release the animals in front of you while you sit in your, in, in your <laughs> chaise lounge. It's a little too easy, frankly. President Obama was born on August 4th, 1961, in Honolulu, Hawaii, and is the legitimate duly elected president of the United States. Further, the people who say that he is not, the so-called birthers, are self-deluding conspiracy theorists who ricochet off reality like a ping-pong ball off a rubber wall. And yet, during the past week, they have been given platforms on major TV and radio shows and echoed even by members of the U.S. Congress. So right now, at what point does the media owe it to you to simply state what is fact and what is nonsense? This clearly, over the last week, became something that people were saying, no, we're going to put this in the air, but then we're going to tell you it's silly. Should it ever have been given any airtime at all? I think this is a story where the standards of new media hmm. are probably better than the standards of old media, because new media is all about taking sides. You right. know, there are liberal blogs and there are conservative blogs, and no one pretends that they are objective, right. they are advocates. Right. Whereas our traditional role in the old media has been to say, well, let's give both sides an airing. But what if you have a story where there are not two sides, where there are is the crazy and the same well, that's side. that's the question I just asked you. Well, what I do you know, do? And, and, and I think the answer is you adopt the standards of new media. And this is actually the question. You compared the mainstream media, which tries to be neutral, to the partisan media, left and right. Right. Why is this a partisan issue? I mean, aren't, mm. there, aren't there certain points of fact that are above partisanship? I, I mean, I just said that. I just looked in the camera and I said, he was born in Hawaii. Darn it. Does that make me a left-wing media figure because well, I said that? Well, but people watching you on television yeah. who then comments on it on their Facebook status or tweet it or write yeah. this in a blog, they're going to go, well, I don't believe you. you but, I don't trust you. But, but also, so that's what's with happening. That. Just 48 hours after causing a furor with the adverb of the apocalypse. Stupidly, stupidly, stupidly. The President of the United States came out himself to the White House briefing room and personally walked those comments right back to the doghouse. Even though he did not use the word apology, it was an apology. But was it a mistake? By admitting error, did President Obama set up his enemies, and by this I mean the press corps, to get ready to roll them the next time around? This segment, being president means never having to say you're sorry, doesn't it? Since Obama has taken the tack, and this is not the first time he's apologized for misstatements, does this mean that the next time he says anything even mildly controversial, there are going to be demands for his apology? It might be. It cre that's true. It creates, it, yeah, it creates this dynamic in the press where the press right. says, oh, we got him to apologize last time. Maybe we can do it right. again. But I think that they have learned, and Obama has learned in the course of the campaign and in the course of his career, that the price you pay for correcting a mistake and saying you're sorry is not as high as conventional wisdom suggests. Is this not utterly insane 
We have the President of the United <laughs> States, the leader of the free world. With a press briefing, I think it was um, on Tuesday, they were actually going on about the brands of beers yes. and demanding to know yes. with, 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 with the anger of Joseph Welch <laughs> at the <laughs> McCarthy hearings, what beer is the president drinking? Yeah, well, and this and is very controversial because everyone, wants to, every, everyone has a different choice of beer. Right. The president wants to drink and Budweiser. Group it. <laughs> right, right, exactly, because you never know. I mean, he, I mean, you know the president. I mean, I'm sorry, I'm going to say this. I've drunk Budweiser on many an occasion, but never by choice. And I'm going to assume that President <laughs> Obama, I've eaten some of the restaurants he eats in, I well, think. <laughs> not to make a prediction, but I predict he'll be apologizing for his beer choice, because Budweiser, as far as I know, isn't even an American beer anymore. No, I know, exactly. <laughs> My God, I'm amazed that hasn't been picked up in the blogs, but don't you know? It's owned by InBev, an evil Belgian beer conspiracy. <laughs> the biggest media event of the week of course, it was the wedding of Kevin Hines and Jill Peterson in St. Paul, Minnesota. Seven million page views and counting for this YouTube video. The Australian version of Dancing with the Stars, the TV program, will recreate this dance on their show. The only problem for them is that may be the highlight of their married lives right there. I don't know. Jose Antonio Vargas. I want you as an internet expert to explain to me why that's the most popular thing in the media world this week. Because it's unscripted joy. What makes a viral video go insane that everyone Actually, wants to Actually, I want to I push back on this because this is something that the media uses a lot. Viral, when, yeah. when we say something goes viral, like yeah. a virus, like the flu virus, right? You're like, it's almost as if you're unknowingly transmitting something. That's not what's happening on the web. People no. are doing this consciously. Well, I mean, so it's not viral. It's what actually you would call a spreadability. People are spreading this knowingly, meaning when I pass around that video to you, I knowingly and deliberately did that. Yeah, it wasn't but, an unconscious thing. But let's be fair. What, what, what people mean by the, by the metaphor viral is it's not you know NBC broadcasting yes. the finale of Seinfeld that everybody's going to watch yeah. and everybody tunes in because NBC has decided to broadcast it. It is something goes up on the internet, person A sees it, gives it to person B and C, person B and C give it to three of their friends and six exactly. of their friends, exactly. and it spreads like a social disease exponentially. <laughs> So, a few years ago, OK Go was just another indie band trying to figure out how to get some attention. Then somebody had one of those brilliant, so simple, why didn't I think of it ideas. Why not choreograph and perform an elaborate dance routine on eight moving treadmills? It became one of the most viewed YouTube videos of all time. Now, Damien Kulash, who is the songwriter, lead singer, and dare we say, principal dancer for the band OK Go, joins us now from Los Angeles. I, I, speaking as someone who's been through this and been the internet viral video star, do, do you have any sense of what these people are going to go through, and do you have any advice for them? Uh, they're going to get a lot of emails from their uh, from people they haven't seen since they were like six. I I can't speak specifically to what happens when like one day you're at a wedding and the next day you're on the Today Show, um, but I do I have noticed you know like. Um, there's a d uh, there's varying levels of grace with which people handle this. You know, like when when suddenly you see uh, the guy from Chocolate Rain like on every TV show in yes. a week, and then he's kind of gone the next day. Yeah. you sort of feel like maybe you could have played that a little slower. You know, <laughs> um, uh, but I, but it's it's hard to know. I, it sort of depends what they want to do. I mean, if these people want to go be a dance troupe, I guess get out there and 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 work your thing as fast as you can. Hi, I'm Peter Sagal. Welcome to our show. It's talk therapy as a treatment program for news junkies.